My name is Paul Banks. Yeah, yeah, you got Mr. Bobby Stills, Never Ran, Never Will. You're watching True Heads, and uh, they're keeping it true, kid. You know what I mean? Bong, bong. By combining the two genres, rap and rock, you both, in a way, are crossing over again. What have been some of the difficulties around that, or have there been any? No difficulties. When we first started, we were just jamming. So there was no expectation, there was no record deal, there was, no, there was nothing other than like, let's just get together and make some music. And out of that session, we got a demo, and then that became you know, a record deal with Warner. So it's always just been kind of fun. And I think that that's what's, that's what's key. I don't know, if it, if it felt like it wasn't working, I think that between us, we'd identify this isn't working, but it, it was. It was something that was satisfying creatively. So I feel like it's just kind of naturally organic sounding. Yeah. And I got to agree with Paul as far as the process of what we did and creating. The only difficulty I'm facing now uh, is, is, which, is, is um, you know, we've been doing it at a high level in the sense of, you know, you know, thousands of kids come to see us in our respective bands. And now we're kind of like, like going back to go in a way. Um, I, I told Paul, it reminds me of the video game, uh, the rock band. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like you know, you know, we started our first gig was in Seattle. Yep. You know, a very tough city to play. Yeah. Nobody never heard our songs before, really. Yeah. And we're here playing our music, trying to win over the win over a crowd, yeah. and win over. They know they know Paul, they know RZA, but they don't know what this new these new songs. And that's a challenge because you know we you know you know you've been a platinum artist. You know, I'm used to everybody on your deck. Like, like his mixtape said, everybody on my deck like they're supposed to be. <laughs> but now, no, you gotta, you gotta get them on your deck. And uh, that's been, a, it's, it's been fun. Like he said, it's been fun every way, but it's, it is still difficult because you pull up and you're like, whoa, okay, this is the venue. Okay, whoa. Okay, that's the dressing room. Okay, whoa, okay, cool, cool. <laughs> okay, you know okay, what I mean? Okay, yeah, okay, whoa. all right, we, we over there. But it's been fun, y'all. Yeah. And you've, you've also been able to successfully cross over into film for music. And we can see and hear the connection music and film have. But what are the industries like? How do they differ? We're both film buffs also. So that's just very important to that. And I think uh, we have a good taste of sensibility when it comes to film. We, act, and we, just, we have a great conversation about it. The music and film industry definitely are um, like like a line, right? With the, you know, you see a line in school and the line points that way and they point that way. But they still start from a central point. And all we have to do is make a curve and they'll come back together. I think they need to be brought back together because uh, music, when, once it was added to film, caused film to expand. Good music to turn a bad movie good. You know what I mean? So the industries are different. Uh, but I think there's a generation in the industry now since, you know, maybe since like maybe the year 2000, 2005, that they've been incorporating more executives from, from music or they've been bringing in more musicians to help, you know, not just a composer, like, like on the show Empire, you see Timberland is the music guy for the TV show. You know, that happened very rarely back in the days when Quincy Jones was doing it. You know, before you had some artist that was able to know them, now you have more. And I think those two industries, especially with the new smartphone devices and the way we, as, as, you, as young people, where y'all are receiving it, I think those two industries got to find the proper merger in order for both of them to continue to grow. And that's what I've been doing for most of my career. If you listen to uh, my, my albums, I was trying to make audio movies because we didn't have DVDs then. And now that we do have, you know, visual and audio are basically one thing now, to me it's the right time for those ideas to really flourish. Sorry, I know this, is, this one's a little bit off topic, but I just needed to ask, is it true that you saved Method Man's life over by 160? <laughs> That's what he told me, you know yeah. what I mean? You know, just that he was headed to get his weed, and the shooters was waiting. And I was like, yo, Meth! Yo, come on, yo. I got, yo, I got to talk to you about the record deal. I got some new information. And he was like, oh, oh, y'all not seriously. I only had a few minutes. He came over, I already had Ray there, a few of us there, he came. And I was like, yo, 
I kind of spilled the ideas that I had in my head. And pop, 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 pop. And that's when that's when you hear Raekwon says on the song. That's when Poppy got shot. Um, and there's many verses that relate to that yeah, day yeah, yeah, yeah. you'll hear throughout Wu Tang history. So, you know, sometimes when somebody's calling, listen. Did you guys know what you wanted to be when you were kids? What was that defining moment when you said to yourself, like, I want to do music forever? For me, there was sort of two moments. One when I was like 12 or 13 when uh, I got into classic rock and Hendrix and stuff and, and uh, I had some compilation record and Dream On by Aerosmith was on it. And that song just like lit something in me that, that that's why I picked up guitar. It was I, I loved that song so much that I had to learn how to play the instrument. And then uh, Nirvana breaking when I was like 15, that was when I said that's, that's what I want to do with my life. Yeah, for me, uh, I think I first heard hip hop at the age of about seven at a, at a I was hanging with my older cousin, uh, Jizza, uh, at, a, at a block party. Back in those days, they would bring out speakers and they'd plug up and the guys would play music out loud and the guy said something like, dip, dip, dive, so socialized, clean out your ears and you open your eyes. It's like this, y'all. And I became immediately addicted. Uh, and I started writing lyrics since the age of eight or nine. I was trying to write or copy. And, but when I heard on the radio, Sugar Hill Gang, Rapper's Delight. Yeah, yeah. I knew that I was going to be on the radio one day, yo. And uh, so that was probably, uh, you know, at the age of nine years old, you know, and I just, that was my passion and I never let it go. Paul, what is it about a guitar that people fall in love with? You almost get this sense that guitar players, it's like their best friend, like they take their guitar with them everywhere they go. Hmm. Good question. Um... I, I, I feel that the piano is probably the, the supreme instrument, but I think a guitar has a, has a really good mix of physicality, you know, like an acoustic, you can kind of like whack it like me, like sort of heavy handed with it, but it also has um, an incredible dynamic range. I would, I guess a, a really high level piano player can accomplish maximum dynamic, but on a guitar, it's pretty easy to kind of quiet to loud and just like there's a texture to it that I think becomes very, it's so expressive that the artist becomes really attached to it as a, like an extension of themselves. So I think it's a great instrument like that and then smaller than a piano too. And Riza, this reminds me of a song you did on Eight Diagrams, The Heart Gently Weeps. Can you tell us about how that song came to be? Yeah, that song came to be uh, <clears throat> because I, I actually became a fan of the guitar myself and by doing so you find different songs that's great. And there was a version of the Hard Jim the Weeks by an artist named Jimmy Ponder that inspired me. So uh, uh, I just was, you know, I wanted to recreate it. And I got a good talk as a gift from Russell Crowe. He gave me a 1961 Gretsch. That's a nice guitar. And I had a chance to become friends with Danny Harrison, the son of George. And I called Danny. I said, look, I got a 1961 Gretsch. I want you to fly over to New York and I want to play your father's song on my new album, and uh, I did, he did it. And I called Erica Badu to give me the hook. And then Ghostface, Mac, and Ray Kwan just dropped those verses, yeah. In the song, Gonna Make It, you mention a lot of isms. Capitalism, baptism, fascism, terrorism. How do you rise above the schism of all the isms, and can you elaborate on inspiration for this song? Yeah, when I, when I mentioned the isms, I also said that all these isms is just another prison or prism, meaning the prism of light. The prism of light is like, you can't see the separate colors because they all come together to form one. And that's what a unified country is supposed to be. That's what a unified race is supposed to be as a human race, you know what I mean? So I thought that all those isms is just another prism that smothered our vision, you know what I mean? And I could go on and on about it. I just thought that I'll put a little few words in there. The only ism I like is wisdom. <laughs> you know what I mean? That one's good. Right, right. There's also a lyric on Gonna Make It that goes, how can a child survive in this world without his mother's wisdom? From a very young age, what are some things that your mother's instilled in your lives and how does it affect you to this day? No, my mother, my mother was a, a single, spent most of her life as a single parent, raising a lot of children and 
she had a very good quality about cleanliness, cleanliness mannerism. Uh, she uh, had a great quality of being like the light of the room, you know, and she also had a great quality of sacrifice. So, you know, the days my mother instilled with me uh, are, you know, are permanent. Uh, can't really, really totally be described in words that the value of them is worth worth planets <laughs> to that level. And uh, just for the fans of mine, I, I pass it to Paul, for the fans of mine, I, I would have no fans and no body aware of my artistic expression if I didn't listen to my mother who saw me going down the wrong path negatively and gave me that mother change your life, go positive. And wanting to please her, you know how you want to please your mom? Mm -hmm. uh, what they call it, uh, not her confirmation, but her- Expectations of you? Her expectation. You know, for your mother to fulfill her expectation of what I could be, it's been a big drive for me in my life. And that drive led to the output of art that I've done. I think uh, my mother, very warm and affectionate person. And that's, you know, she gave me that, uh, that capacity, I think, uh, to be warm and affectionate. And she uh, showed me how to treat women, which has been handy. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't I mean that in, no, in, in little, she gave me some even, even little tricks and things like that in terms of, she said, just shut up, shut up and listen. Ask questions and listen. Wow. It's genius level. That's the piece, that's the piece of the puzzle I'm missing. Just <laughs> shut up and listen. <laughs> so looking back, did you ever think like 19 people in a two bedroom apartment that you would have built all of this? For me, you know, for me, I don't want to sound egotistical, but I'm going to answer that question with the truth, which is yes. I always felt like, I would, I would tell Dirty since we was 14 years old, and Dirty was 15, I was 14 years old, a little older than me, right? I always telling yo, I, like something in my heart telling me that we're meant for something great. I knew we wasn't going to be stuck selling no apples and oranges, <laughs> <laughs> selling newspapers, and 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 and, and, eat, and trying to eat and trying to get and try to you know save ice. Yeah. Now I felt that something was was destined to be great within us, and I and I say, and, I, and I'm not saying that that I've reached that yet. Music is great, but maybe there's even something greater. But I knew that that you know that something was better in, in store for me, even in the midst of of where things look hopeless. Rizzo, you've always been a teacher and have never shied away from sharing your wisdom in your music. I read that you learned the 120 at 12 years old. Can you explain what the 120 is and how you got involved? I could simply say that it provided me with knowledge of self. And by knowing myself, I'm able to know others. And that's, I think, is mandatory for every man walking the planet is to have knowledge of his self and then realizing by knowing his self he can know others and he can relate to others. Paul, do you follow any religions or any belief systems? Do you, do, would you say that you're spiritual? I would say I'm spiritual, but I don't follow any particular religion or belief system. Well, my own personal belief system. Are you ever afraid of how the press and media might portray you guys? Uh, like what's it like? It must be nerve wracking to do an interview and you kind of feel investigated, and <laughs> and you might be like, I can understand that totally. Is there, is there anything that maybe you'd want to clear up from anything in the past? Is there anything you guys want to discuss? I don't read any press since '06. Yeah. I don't wow. read reviews or any, <laughs> any press, and I'm par partly because I think there'd be so many things that I'd want to clear up and address. I don't even look at my Wikipedia page because I once looked at it and something on it pissed me off and I don't want to spend my life worrying about fixing shit like, you know, who cares? Um, and then, yeah, I kind of feel like as an artist, you know, you do the art part and then the rest is kind of like, hey man, you know, I'm not yeah. worrying about it. And I'm, I'm, I, I, it depends on when you cast me. Sometimes I don't care two cent shit with somebody else, right? Because I know how much I can bench press, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And by knowing myself, I'm very confident in what I do. I'm very, uh, I'm very comfortable being me, you know. You know what I mean? 
that's I don't, you know some people need people to tap them on their shoulder for being them. You know, the one time I did get really pissed off, P, was when <clears throat> I read a review on my movie, and the dude gave me a very bad review. And so I kind of remembered his name. Like, you know, so let me just read some of his other reviews and watch his future reviews. <laughs> oh, shit. Exactly. Right. And he's given some of the corniest, worst movies great reviews. And I said, you know what? It, 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 it had nothing to do with my film. He got something against me. Right. You know what I mean? Because there's nowhere in the world on some of the films that he reviewed he gave B's and A's that was like, you know what I mean? Yeah. That, so that was the only time I really felt like I was going to call in. It wasn't the only time. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's no, the thing. Yeah. I don't want, I, I've, yeah, it's, I've it's, got it's, guys it's, that I could do that with as well that I want to do that with. You know, uh -huh. but, but. That's a tough one. It, Wu, Wu used to, you know, we would like to beat you up back in the early days of Wu. It's like, we would like to, because it's like, it's like a judge who sends a man to jail for 10 years, but the judge never been in jail. He don't really understand what he's sentencing that guy to. You know what I mean? He spent three nights in there, and a guy did a crime, like to say the guy was a 16-year-old kid who, all 16-year-old kids are developing. Maybe the kid sold some weed, which is now legal, right? But for us, 16-year-old kids was going to jail for selling weed. And now you're in jail for a few years of selling crack. You're in jail for three grams of cocaine for three years of your life, and you just was trying to buy a pair of sneakers probably. Yeah. And then the judge has no relation, he can't realize what the kid is going through or what he's about to put that kid through because he hasn't been through it. I look the same way sometimes you look in the, in the phase of hip hop of the critics back then, they didn't know what it was, you couldn't measure that. Or even with our collaboration, I mean, if you like music, you could say, well, it's not your kind of music. But you can't really measure the collaboration because you can't find 20 things to weigh it against. You know what I mean? How do you guys feel about, you know, like this year we've seen a lot of footage of police brutality in the mainstream media. Do you guys have children? I'm sure you guys have kids. Yeah, yeah? I do. You know, he's you working on kids? it. Working on it. Well, well <laughs> <laughs> how, like, have you had to have a conversation with them about police brutality? Like, how do you prepare your kids for what's going on? I mean, look, first of all, you got to, First thing, my children gotta respect law and authority. You know what I mean? That's why we have law, so you have law and order. That's why we have a red light. If you run the red light, there's a chance the other guy's gonna crash into your car. I think what I do tell my children is to always respect authority. And, and sadly, I have to tell my children not to, uh, not to resemble the stereotype. You know what I mean? It's like if right now they tell me that everybody with that cap on, that you, you got your stick on, your cap still. If they say everybody with their stick on their cap is an asshole. And if you come out with the stick on your cap, you're gonna be smart enough to say, yo, hold on, I'm not an asshole. Even though that don't define you, you better off taking it off so that you won't be thrown in that pot. Because when, they, when somebody is swooping in, for the black man gotta realize that we've been shown to the world as always on the criminal level, aggressive, you know, this is, you know, hundreds of movies that show us as criminals. The news reportings, the gangs, everything you see about it. You don't see, you know, until, you know, you see the President Obama, you know, showing that, yo, hold on, it's a guy from, he, he's from Chicago too. <laughs> you know what I mean? But he's presidential. You don't see those, that kind of image of us. So because we don't got that, we got to be extra conscious that, yo, we're fit in the description that is stereotyped. One thing that was big for me in the 90s was Minister Society, which is a film I love, right? It wasn't until I went to Europe and China that I saw that that film, you know, I loved it, that it actually had something about it that was disturbing, which was the opening sequence of the young black kid with braids or dreads, which I'm wearing braids, walks into a Korean bodega and shoots the dude, shoots the family over 40 ounce, and then he's watching it. It's a neighborhood hit, you know what I mean? So now, if you are in Europe or France or China or some other country and you just see that, you're thinking in your mind, yo, any, any kid you see like that is a problem. You gotta be nervous. So when the police come to the community, they nervous. They thinking like that. So I think that our image is, is, is something we gotta always be aware of. But 
same time, police brutality is savagery because the police have the authority, the strength, the guns, the manpower, everything to easily turn any situation to a not useful force situation. They could easily do that. I mean, it's, it's usually more cops than perpetrators. They have guns, they have training. They have psychological classes. They're not high school dropouts. You have to at least graduate from high school. I heard even get a year or two in college nowadays. So here you go, educated people, and here you go, you're gonna, you, can't, you, don't have, you don't have the wisdom to deal with the situation, and you signed up for this job. A police, to me, should be a hero. A fireman is a hero. These are people who have a braveness in them. But if you give the bully the job, or you give the nerd the job, you're gonna have a problem because the bully's gonna abuse his ability, and the nerd's gonna be fearful when having to complete his job. We should scream better, like, you know what, this guy's a good guy. I got a son that'll climb the tree for you and get the cat. He should be a cop. Because when you call him, he's coming to help. If you guys have any just last words of encouragement for artists trying to make it in the industry. I think persistence is the, is the main thing. You know, if you can, don't give up. Uh, and I think if you're, you know, starting artists, if you, I don't, there's a couple little strategies, like don't play too often. You want to keep, you know, people coming to your show, filling up the room. And once you start filling up rooms, everything's going to fall into place. So you really only need to look that far as bringing people to come and see you. And I'll say, don't, you know, do your art and don't worry about uh, the results of it. It's a big thing that's hard to phantom because some of the greatest paintings we ever seen, the painting had no value. The painter has to finish the painting. So I think an artist should always just go ahead and do his thing and don't think about the value of it because the people will put the value on it, you know what I mean? And I'll, I'll make a comment real quick before Rizzo goes. You know, you know, you asked us a few questions that, that got us to, you know, to talk politics a little bit and talk about, you know, police brutality and things. It's not really the artist's responsibility. And even though you see a lot of artists, the artist's responsibility is to create art and entertain you. When we make our money, they take taxes out and they send that to the politicians, to the police force, to the street cleaners. So we are paying for them to do, to do that service. And I mean, our duty is to entertain you so that, you know, when you got a little trouble on your mind, here's a song, here's a movie, we have you chill out and relax for the afternoon. And then the money we're making is paying for those guys. So I would say people out there, artists, be artists. Don't think about if you have to be political, you know, do what you want. You know, the art will define the time, but don't feel compelled that you gotta be that guy because we pay for our politicians and for our law enforcement and for our city structure to take care of that for us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you.